So um, basically all that I did was I studied, it's not, it's not that my left hand is really that fast, it's how I use it. And it's fast enough to create most of the things that I want to do, but I'm constantly working on it. I haven't got my left hand where I'd like to have it yet. It's not up to Joe Morello speed or any kind of ridiculous, you know, single stroke roll caliber, but um, um, I, pl I practiced a lot of rudiments, basically. And um, so, so when I was first taught, I just uh, started with the military grip. Uh, yeah, so I, I, had, I had started learning the military grip in my left hand. And, you know, what I, the, the thing that I try to do is I'm a big fan of rebound. I always have been. And, um, see, I know some guys who could sit on a couch or, or like a pillow or something that has no rebound and just, you know, <laughs> just rip the thing apart. Well, me, you know, I always use things that had bounce and... <laughs> I always use my fingers. So, so what I always tried to do was try to use as much bounce as I could. So, so that's how I always tried to get away with my left hand. I, I use rebound. So, same goes for my right hand, you know, and, and a lot of times I use techniques that, that allow me to utilize rebound to its fullest potential, you know. So, that's how I, I you know... practice singles and doubles, trying to get the same kind of bounce out of the stick with doubles as I do out of singles. So, so I would suggest practicing to learn how to control the bounce of the drumstick in order to develop that kind of speed, because there's a lot of bounce there in the stick, you know? Also. What I would try to do is, um, is um, the principle of whipping the stick as well, you know, revitalizes the stroke so that you make the stick do the work for you. So I try to apply that principle in both of my hands, and it's kind of an offshoot, a throw off from the Moeller method of snare drumming that um, not, not too many people, I don't think there's too many people that teach it nowadays, but l you see a lot of drummers that use it. How many drummers have you seen that kind of whip the drumstick? You know, it's, it's pretty common, I would imagine. Guys do it and they don't even know it. But when you apply this, this technique fastidiously to snare drumming and you're controlling, can somebody open the door? Yeah, I suddenly... Me okay. Can everybody understand my... Horrible English? Okay. Uh, you know, just whistle or something if you want me to stop or scream and say shut up, repeat yourself, you know. Um, anyway, I uh, hope I'm not boring all of you. And um, anyhow, anyhow, back to what I was saying. Um, there, there was a, 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 a snare drum teacher at the turn of the century named Sanford Moeller, Sanford A. Moeller, who observed that a common trait that most swift drummers seem to have was the ability of the stick to, to propel itself. And it seemed like the stick had properties of its own to put itself into motion. And the way that these drummers made that happen was by creating that whip. So, uh, 
um, so, so by using that kind of rebound... <laughs> You could make a stick. You could really cause a stick to. Move by itself. So the whole idea is to get that whip going. That's another way that you could you could make the stick, the drumstick, the rebound work for you. So that's one of the things that I did when I developed my left hand as well as my right. And um, the same for double strokes. I always use, I always tend to use hand to hand combinations. Like I don't just play single strokes a lot of the times. Um, I think that a good working knowledge of rudiments is essential when you're trying to develop that kind of speed, and that you practice it slow to fast. You know. Um, because a lot of times I'll use triplets and I play two doubles in my left hand. Six stroke rolls instead of single strokes. And so on and so on, you know. And that will also give you that sense of speed. And it's not cheating, it's just a different stroke. It's just. Five stroke rolls, roughs, all that kind of stuff will. with your wrists, single strokes with your wrists, and gradually increasing your speed until you feel comfortable. So um, that's how I got a lot of, of my principles of, of technique, you know. And also the press rolls, too. I think that, that practicing on a pillow, though, and things like that could be good as long as you stay relaxed because you're going to use your muscles. But... Um, <laughs> I really think that practicing on a drum and developing the touch for a, the drum is the best way to get the sound out of the instrument, as opposed to just developing muscles, because, you know, every surface requires a different touch, you know? I mean, a lot of times I see piano players on a tabletop doing like doing this, but inevitably they have to sit down at a piano, you know? I mean, that's just the way it is, and you develop a touch to your instrument by knowing exactly how the key responds, because there's a complex mechanism in there. Every time you hit a key, the hammer, and everything that strikes, you know, the tabletop doesn't have that. Well, neither does a pillow, you know. So we're talking about touch here as opposed to just sheer muscle development. Because then when you're trying to get a sound out of a drum, if you're trying to play a really soft, whoa, okay, a really soft roll, you know, from... You know, to get that kind of you know, you gotta you gotta practice that stuff, you know. So on on a drum. I mean you can't do that on a pillow, but you know, a pillow can, can make your wrist muscles I mean, you know, it's just whatever you wanna do. Yes. No, I haven't written any drum books. I got um I was approached to write a drum book about five years ago by Alfred Music and I never threw one together. I never did it because I didn't know what to write. I, I, thought, I thought I might write something about polyrhythms, but Pete Magadini already did it. However, uh, he didn't really write it for the drum set. 
Uh, Chafee kind of did. Um, but it's, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, see, I'm the kind of person that for me to sit down and then compile a book, you know, it's a hard thing to do because then I, I might, for example, I might, I might write ideas down that I like and then two weeks later look at them and hate them. So I, it's hard for me to do that even with tunes. When I write tunes, it takes me forever to do it because, you know, I like it and then five minutes later I can't stand it and I erase everything, you know. Um, it's a good thing I can't erase what I'm doing live. Otherwise, I probably would never even play. But uh, no, I haven't. I haven't written any any uh, any drum books, you know. But I, I I should do that. I would like to do it. I know a lot of guys are doing it now. Like Weckl's got that contemporary music minus one thing, which is real good. And S Smith just put out a, a video on DCI. Actually, I've been approached to do a video. Only problem is, is the market is so flooded with videos. It's like everybody has a drum video out. You know, all of a sudden there's going to be a Vinny video. Well, big deal, you know. You know, I don't know. Maybe maybe people would like to see it, but but it, I really don't know. I uh, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Yes. Uh, how do I keep on approving myself? Well, I think the the bottom line, I think that the most important thing to remember for that is to really care and love what you do and have. Uh, a passion for the instrument that never s dies, you know. And if that happens, um, you know, you'll have a natural, healthy urge to progress, to make new kinds of music. And um, then there's always the neurotic person who has neurotic desires to improve himself as well. But um, not me, though. <laughs> um, but but I think that the, the whole idea is not to become jaded and um, to not get too comfortable with, with yourself to where you think that you've got it all together and then suddenly one day you wake up and you find out you're, you're kind of stale. You, you have to know and trust within yourself when you, when you just suddenly feel stale and all of a sudden things aren't flowing like they should. You really need to sit down and shed with the drums, just you and the drums for a few hours every day, every day until it just comes out naturally. Um, and uh, that kind of quest will, will help you improve yourself and just uh, never being quite happy with yourself enough to feel too overly confident. Uh, but don't, don't be do too hard on yourself either, you know, because if you, I mean, you can never be happy with yourself and then you'll be always constantly in that state, you know. Um, I know I'm, I have a tendency to be too hard on myself. Um, Whatever, whatever works for you so that you always keep that going. Um, it's important. It really is important. When you get inspired by music, certain kinds of music, uh, obviously that's going to make you, you want to improve. You're going to hear somebody play something, a drummer that really turns you on. Or you're going to hear a sax player. Or you're going to hear a composition that just makes you want to sit down behind the drums and play. And join in. And join in and play with, with them and make that music with them and react and communicate with them. It's going to make you want to go, gee, I like this. This makes me feel good. And then if you can't do it comfortably, you'll, you'll want to do it and you'll work at it until you're able to express that emotion. And the, the important thing is to be able to, to, to learn how to play whatever it is you can't play so that you can express your emotion through that idiom, if you understand what I'm saying. So. Yeah, the uh, question was, is do I do much two-track live to digital recording? And um, the answer is, is there, I don't do a lot of it, but um, I, I have done some. Uh, I did a record by, by a guy named Bill Myers, and he, he's, a, he's a writer in Los Angeles, and we did the recording live to digital two-track. And, you know, that means that we didn't use a 24-32 track machine. You use a two track and you just, everybody plays at the same time because there's no overdubs. Um, we did the Bill Myers Images record that way. And uh, it's pretty challenging because, um, see, the whole deal is, is that you have a whole bunch of guys playing at the same time in a room. And 
with two track tape you, you can stop yet you can stop playing and rewind back to the top but uh, you know it's just it's just that you got you know optimally you have to play it right the first time because you, you're not going to go back and overdub so the producer usually books less time in the studio so you don't have that much time to do it and it's like you know the more people you have in the room together the more chance you have of making a mistake so if you have 60 guys playing together th there's more of a chance that one guy's going to play a wrong note so everybody has to be on their toes see what i mean and when we did the images record it was just like that we played like a whole side without stopping you know we played one tune and then we'd pause for four seconds and then we'd go into the next tune and so we just sight read everything down and it was complex because we had we had like two fair lights there and a j I mean a, a plethora of synthesizers, an amazing amount of electronic instruments and programmers and strings, full string section, full horn section, percussion, three percussion or whatever and you know drums and rhythm section and uh, and conducted and, and so it was it was pretty intense to do that in the reading so you really had to be on your toes to do that. Uh, the only thing that's really more difficult than that is is direct to disc, because as you're playing, your the disc is being cut, and um, and and um, that's 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 really tough. I I think I did one thing like that once. Uh, in fact, I did I did something for JVC, a demonstration record for a digital machine, and I just played all solo drums, and it was about seven years ago. And they played it at one of the Audio Engineering Society's AES conventions. And that's all that it was used for, was a demo for JVC. And um, it was just drum solo, you know? And that was the only thing that I had done like that. Um, but but um, it's pretty challenging. I'll never forget this one story about Jocko. Uh, somebody told me that they were doing a record. I think it was like, oh, Lee Rittenauer told me this. He said they were doing a record. It was him and... and uh, I think Dave Grusin and Tom Scott and Anthony Jackson, those guys, I'm pretty sure it was them, and they were almost done. And Harvey Mason was playing, I think. And they were almost done with the disc. And who storms into the studio? But Jocko. Right right when they were done, almost done. So, so needless to say, they had to stop the disc and do the whole thing <laughs> over again. <laughs> and Lee always tells me the story, and it's a pretty funny story, I thought, you know, because... You know, if you knew what what kind of a personality Jocko was, God rest his soul. You know, you you have to laugh and just laugh with him because he was an amazing human being. You know, and uh, you could only laugh at that kind of a thing. You know, but uh, that that kind of thing always made me smile. You know, when I heard that story, and it kind of always took that that curtain of of darkness off of digital recording. You know, you know the, the seriousness away from it all, and just kind of always shed some laughter on it. So. Anyway. Uh, yes, uh, the question was what I talk a little bit about my cymbal setup and what I use. Um, what I use is... Um, <coughs> the cymbals that I use are... Uh, by all obviously all Zildjian symbols, all I use K Zildjian symbols, and I've been using them for a great many years now. Uh, ever since Zildjian started producing the K Zildjian symbol again, I took to it like like a fish to water, and um, like I always admired that old K sound that Tony and the guys used to get, but for a lot of types of contemporary music, it's a little too spready. It's too, it has too much spread. So when Zildjian started producing the Ks again, they re tried to retain that sound, the flavor that the old Ks had, but get rid of that the swim so that it would have some definition. And they succeeded. I think the most triumphant success in that was producing the K Custom. Because as you can hear, the K Custom has a nice dark sound, but it doesn't spread too much. So still, you still get the stick definition, but it's darker than a regular symbol. Now, this one might sound a little brighter to you than some. The attack, especially because it's a brilliant, it has a brilliant finish on it. So the brilliant finish accounts for 
It's it's a funny thing. It it kind it kind of does a, a it's a two sided thing. I find that it on some symbols it mellows the sound out, and on others it it kind of gives it a little more attack. Um, and um, for the crash symbols, uh, I use the K, uh, the K dark crashes with a brilliant finish. Again, it's a dark symbol, but the brilliant finish somehow. I don't know what it does to it, but it it. It just makes it into some other kind of magical thing. Like I've I've used it. I use it for everything. So whatever the brilliant finish does, because I used K, K dark crashes before, but when Zildjian introduced the brilliant dark crashes, suddenly I found I was able to use it for any kind of musical situation. Um, they speak quickly. They're not too dark. They're not too bright. And what I usually use is I use the 17 crash on the left and the 15 on the right. And as you can hear, it's a well-matched pair of cymbals. Here we've got an 8-inch K splash. And over here, we've got, uh, we've got uh, an A Zildjian China. It's a swish, 18-inch swish. This isn't what I usually use. I don't usually use a swish. I usually use uh, a variety of China types. My favorite is a 14-inch swish with rivets, which Zildjian doesn't produce anymore. But um, it's really like kind of a firecracker. It's a real quick symbol. You can get other, Ian, can you get other symbols that can approximate that sound? Oh, uh, Ian Croft here from Zildjian uh, has informed me that uh, they are producing um, something comparable to that right now as we speak. So uh, fortunately, you'll be able to obtain that kind of sound. And for hi-hats, I use a K top and a Z bottom. That's a good combination for me because, um, you know, the Ks tend to produce a, a warm kind of a sound. And when you put the Z bottom, right away you get, you get a harder edged kind of a chick sound. And, you know, you get more, more of a cut, cutting sound than you normally would if you used both Ks. So that's what I use. And, and so when I, when I pick out a set of cymbals, Usually, I, I try to find the individual cymbal sound by itself first. You get a good sounding cymbal. Like, I, uh, like I'll try to get a good sounding ride cymbal, something that sounds like it's going to be good for everything. Then I try to match two crash cymbals together and then listen to the cymbals and put them up and see if they sound good with the ride and so on. So I do it in steps to make sure I get an overall good sounding set of cymbals. And, um, I like when the cymbals are playable. They're not too hard so that they're soft and you feel like you can sink into the cymbal. And I like when I can crash on the ride cymbal. Like I, used, I like to crash on the ride cymbal when I play it. So, you know, I get a cymbal that's not too hard so that I can do that. And then obviously the hi-hats, the same thing. I have my own set of criteria for the hi-hats as well. Uh, make sure that they feel good and they just have just that right sound. It's like your ears after a while they get accustomed to you know what you want right away. So so that's that's what I do. And I have an alternate set of symbols that I use as well. Sometimes I use paper thin A crashes, 16 and 14s, and I use an Amir ride and I have these 12 inch hi hats. So, uh, what are the hi hats called? They're called the studio hi hats. They're kind of a uh, little thicker than a splash symbol and. Um, so I'll use that for an alternate set of symbols. Yes. Uh, his question is basically, how do I build up speed on the bass drum? Uh, my answer to that is that I don't, I don't have a, a legitimate bass drum technique. Basically, I just did it from playing. And again, you know, that, that same kind of thing is, as I utilize it the same way, excuse me, that I utilize my hands. Um, it's not so much the speed that I have with my foot, but how I use it. What I, what I do is I try to incorporate all of my limbs together so that they all work fast together. Not so much that they're unbelievably fast on their own, you know, but, but that they all work fast together, so it's what I play and how I use it, you see. It's fast enough to play certain things. 
And so I would, in a lot of times when I practice things, I practice things to get them real tight, real accurate, uh, you know, kind of a, a bass drum thing. Uh, like I'll practice grooves and things that, that challenge me so that I have to play real tight like I would in the studio for, for a drum machine. Do we have a boom? Oh, here's a mic over here. Um, yeah, there we go. And uh, just, you know. So I'll, I'll practice grooves like that, and after a while, I, I can feel it in my in my foot, you know. You know, and so when you when you use those kind of patterns in conjunction with one another, then you, you'll build up enough speed to play with whatever patterns you need. And the important thing is is that you can have the fastest foot in the world, but that don't mean it's gonna groove. You see, when you get into a studio, you get into a band and you play, it better be funky. Otherwise, you know what I mean? It's like to whip out the buttons, you know? Otherwise, uh, it's machine time. Because uh, the whole thing about a human drummer is the human drummer's feel. So um, you want to be able to play tight like a machine, but you want to make it feel better than a machine, you see? So that's, that's your objective. And um, so, so that's when you, no matter what you play, if you're going to play fast or exercises, you should always try to make, make it groove, you know? And try to, like whenever you play, like you can practice doubles, you know, between your hands and feet, but, but like if you practice it within a groove, it makes it more us musically interesting to you, know, you know? So that so that way you have it. And then when you do that, it it makes musical sense. Thank you. And then and then it makes musical sense, you know. And uh, it's it's more fun. And you do it slow, and then you build it up. That's that's what I usually do. You know? And it's, some of the stuff can get pretty hairy, you know. And, and so so. That, that's all that I really do. And, and I always play with my heel with my heel up unless I'm playing just like a, you know, something simple, like a simple tune or a ballad if I'm playing, you know, real simple. Then I'll play with my, my foot down. So, so no matter what I do, you know, it's it, and usually to get the volume, then I'll lift my foot up and I'll just throw some weight into it, you know. But otherwise, that's basically it. I mean, I can't sit here and like dazzle you with a one foot roll that's really fast or anything. But you know, I can make music on the drums, you know. I hope, and that's that's what I think it boils down to. Because I mean, you know, after a while, it's like it's nice to be able to sit around and go, God, I wish I can do that, I wish I can do that, you know, and, you know, you just got to sit down and, and practice it for a million hours a day until you can do it, you know. Sometimes for me, that's not possible, you know, for me to do that. And then, then it just, it just feels good to sit down behind a set of drums and just play a groove, you know. Yes. Um, 
How was it to work with Frank Zappa? He wanted to know if it improved my playing at all. Yes, it, it did improve my playing. I feel it did because, um, you know, when I first got the job with Frank, it was like a thing where, you know, I, so much was happening to me was being thrown at me at once so fast that it was like, I mean, I had to like catch all the stuff and juggle it and try to, you know, make sense out of it and spit it right back out. And after the end of a couple years with him, it, it all kind of was falling into place. Actually, if I would have stayed with him longer, I could have taken it even to another level, I think. You know, it really would have started getting, like if I had another year with him, it really would have started burning, you know. But the thing is, is that, you know, things just happen for a reason, you know, in, in a person's life. And in my life, you know, I had the opportunity to do a couple of record projects at the same time, and so that's why I had left the band, because I wanted to, I couldn't, when I was with Frank, I couldn't work when I got off the road. When I went back home, after the tours, I, nobody would call me, you know, because here I was out of town for three, four months at a time, I'd go back home, I couldn't get a gig, you know, because everybody thought I was out of town, and you know, you gotta establish yourself and stick around town if you wanna start working and, and doing dates and working in the studios and all that kind of stuff. Um, it takes years to, I mean, it's hard to break into that. You know, you gotta be real lucky and the politics, people gotta talk for you and you got musicians have to recommend you and, and, and just, it's hard, you know? But uh, with Frank, it definitely improved me. It def definitely, I, I felt an improvement because I mean, we worked really hard on that gig. We worked really, really hard. I mean, we would like rehearse for a couple of hours, two and a half hours in the afternoon, play two, two and a half hour shows a night, seriously, five hours a night. And then, so we'd be playing like seven and a half hours a day, plus traveling. And that's, that's a lot of work. I'm sorry. I don't care how young and virile you are. That's a lot of work. I was 21 when I did the gig, or 22, you know. And that's still, I was like, Puffin' and puffin', boy, you know, because that's that that was rough, but uh, it was real education, you know. But we had a good time because everybody was blown, and I got a real, I got a chance to improvise. It was like part of my job; I had to do it, you know. So I definitely improved. Yes. Uh, yeah about chart reading techniques. Um, well, the thing about chart reading is it's mostly, when you're reading a chart, it's, you're dealing mostly with interpretation more than you are reading that's like, you know, you're not like reading exact notes all, a lot of the time, you know. You got a big piece of cardboard or something, something I can write on, I can show you something. You know, let, me, let me see if we could kind of whip something up, you know. See if I can. I'm going to try to show you guys something here. Hang on, bear with me for one moment, please. times just this is like a very very simple thing uh, and I hope that most of you can see this like this is just one bar of music let's do a little dance with it you know 
<laughs> a beast walking away from me. And so, um, if I get a chart, you might have one bar of music. I don't know if all of you can see this. Did you see that? So you got three slashes, an eighth rest, and then a, uh, an eighth note. So you got one, two, three, four, ting, 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 zoom, bah, right? That's all you're going to see on a chart. But what it really means is probably something more like this. If you're playing swing, you're going to play ting, 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 ba, ting, ba. You know, you know what I'm saying? This is like snare drum, cymbal, and bass drum together, and bass drum and cymbal crash together. So, so in other words, you have to interpret how you're going you're gonna to approach it because they don't write all the notes. Now, for this part of the bar, you could play, I mean, it could be a number of things. You know, you got, you got this much time to fill up and anticipate it. That's called an anticipation. I'm going to anticipate into the next bar. You know? so, so you could approach it a variety of ways when the chart's wide open. Now, you know, it, it could be a pop chart, and they'll write the same exact thing. You know, it could be reggae, it could be anything. You know, as long as it's in 4 4. You know, it, it's all the same. It's all the same, because it's only straight ace or shuffle. It could be slow, it could be fast. So it's all on how you interpret the music, you know, how, how, you, how, you, how you interpret it, you know. And, um, so, so whenever you see kicks like that, a lot of times the charts, they just write those simple kind of kicks. And I had a, when I was in Berkeley, I had a chart reading class for a short amount of time. But the best way is if you can get into a big band. Do you have any big bands here that are rehearsal bands? Do you have that? If you can get into one of those bands, that's the best way to do it. And usually those rehearsal bands, like they'll play, they'll play charts that have been recorded by more famous big bands like Maynard Ferguson and Buddy Rich and Stan Kenton and Count Basie and uh, Rob Mouncey and, and all those guys and, and um, just the boss brass, you know, they'll, they'll play all those charts and then you can go out and buy the records and listen to how the drummer plays it. Take your music home and listen to how he plays this stuff, you know. And then you'll s start singing because a lot of times, like, even when I, when I, I used to play drums on the Late Show and we did a lot of big band charts, like, we did some of the, uh, the Boss Brass, Rob McConnell's Boss Brass, we did, it's a Canadian big band, a very good big band. And we did some of their charts, and they were the exact charts, you know, like, like you could send away for those charts. So the music librarian on the show, he sent away for the big band charts in the exact same music, and we just played it. And same with like a lot of those, like those Count Basie char uh, t tunes, you know. One day we had Sammy Nestico come on the, uh, the show and he conducted the band and Sammy Nistico, he wrote so many charts for Count Basie. He was like the arranger for Count Basie. So I flipped, you know, because here I got a chance to work with Count Basie's arranger, you know, and his charts were great, you know, and uh, so he would tell me, he would give me little pointers and things of how he wanted and every arranger's different, you know, so it's, it's just like anything else, taking direction from whoever. You know, and and you know, learning how, learning that it's up to you to fill in the gaps and listening and keeping your ears open. And a lot of times, uh, you know, these these things you, you can like read the the lead trumpet player's music. A lot of lot of uh, big band drummers they take the lead trumpet player's music and they they follow what he plays because those are all important kicks. You know, a lot of times. And um, so that's how I'd advise to do it because basically the rhythms that you're reading, it's not. The rhythms that is hard, it's the interpretation. So that's the whole key to it. And that's where your identity really comes into play. Yes? Yes, equipment question. Is the snare drum a Ludwig snare drum? Yes. It is a Ludwig Superphonic 400 snare drum, chrome, and it has a, uh, it has a pearl head. It's a fiber skin, basically a Remo fiber skin head. It's uh it just you know, it just says pearl on it, but it's it's a Remo fiber skin head. And uh, it belongs to a great English drummer named Steve White. Um who used to be is he still with the Style Council? Uh he used to be with the Style Council. And uh he was kind enough to let me use his snare drum on the entire tour because unfortunately um 
we were having some equipment problems uh, obtaining the snare drum of my choice for this tour. Usually I, I like to use a Yamaha piccolo snare drum and um, there was a shortage of availability for the brass plated piccolo snare drums so we couldn't get them. You know, we got one in England but it was uh, we had problems with it. So I had to borrow one of Steve's drums. No, it's not mine. See, I, I do use a variety of snare drums, however, though. See, the snare drum is really the heart of the matter. And, you know, the, the way I look at it is, is that I, I use whatever sounds good, you know. There's a lot of snare drums out there that sound good, but I do endorse and use Yamaha drums. Now, in the case of my cymbals, I don't have to look any further than Georgia's because I can get anything I need out of a Georgia cymbal. And that's no hype. That's just the truth. So basically, endorsement or no endorsement, I use what I like, what's going to make, what's going to sound good, you know. Yep. Uh, I'm going to turn that question over to Ian here. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, you can buy them individually or you can buy them as a pair. You can actually buy them as a matched pair, a KZ combination pair. Or you can buy a K-top, or you can buy a Z-bottom, whichever. They're all, all hi-hats. You can buy tops or bottoms. Make any, for argument's sake, you can get away from this research. Mel Gainer uses like a 14 quick beat top and a 14 Z-bottom. So this, you should mess around with hi-hats because they're really interesting. Sorry. Hey, we should be like, yeah, all right. We're like Mr. Evil, we're the movie critics, you know. In the United States, there's there are two movie critics. They're called Sis Siskert and Ebel, I think. So we can get up here and debate about stuff. You know. Yes. Fusion. Cuban. Cuban. Um. Yeah. Well. Um, excuse me. Some of um, some of my grooves remind him. him. He was he, the gentleman was saying that he said that some of my grooves remind him of fusion music and Cuban music. Um, Cuban fusion music. Yes, that's that's a new thing. Type. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, see that you know that that little thing is is like uh, that's like a wah wah co thing, dun, 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 dun. and that you know a lot of fusion players took to that beat. See, I came up in that fusion era. My age group, you know, is of that fusion time period. So obviously, I'm influenced as a fusion drummer. You know, like jazz and rock and roll and funk and everything, but. See, fusion got a bad name, too, unfortunately, because, you know, of a lot of reasons. But it doesn't have to be that way. I mean, um, yeah, I listen to everything. I listen to a lot of the great fusion players, and I like to play fusion, too. And, uh, but I like to, I, you know, I like to play straight rock and roll and straight jazz and straight, straight ahead black funk, you know. And then I'll turn around and play fusion, too, you know. Um, because it's it's a good thing. It's a whole. I mean, see, like, you know, I just arbitrarily decided to play that way today, you know, and you know, I could have played, I could have decided to play grooves that sounded more like they were off of a Sly and the Family Stone record, but I decided not to, and I decided to do that because I'm up here playing a drum solo all by myself. So I got to play something that's going to be musical and, and sound like it grooves, but at the same time, it's going to give me the chance to stretch. And a lot of that fusion stuff, you know, it's, it's set up so that you can improvise like that, you know? Not that you can't do it on a straight funk thing, but a lot of those grooves in those funk, they're designed that you just want to sit on those grooves because they feel so good, you know? Whereas the Cuban thing is... You know, you could just play 
I mean, I mean, th the, just the nature of the way that a Latino rhythm section is set up is that one guy will play the clave forever and another guy will just blow, you know? So, so that's the whole thing. You could just set up a, a clave with your hi-hat and kick drum and just scream on top upstairs, you know? So that's why I do that a lot of times. And it feels good. And I've been influenced by Latin music, you know? I've, um, you know, I've got a lot of Latin feeling when I play a lot of times because I, I feel that Latino music has a lot of exciting rhythmic c capabilities. Yes. <laughs> I got a band. Would you like to join it? <laughs> That's great. Two more questions. Two more questions. Ian tells me. How did I practice odd time signatures and anticipations in time, odd time signatures? No, wh when I was practicing this stuff, I was 14, 15 years old, there was no such thing as a sequencer. They didn't even invent it. They may, maybe, I think they had like a little beatbox on the home organs. That's all that there was, you know, that was before drum machines ever were invented, you know. Uh, you know, the only thing that they had at that time was like a little metronome that went, you know, so I would just sit down behind a drum set and play. And I'll tell you where I really got my most experience with clicks is um, 